In this video lesson, we're going to be calculating a new metric unit called heat, otherwise represented as Q. So in this lesson, we'll be talking about what is a heat of reaction, we'll be talking about the practice of calorimetry, and we'll be looking at what we call the specific heat capacities of different samples. The heat of any chemical reaction can be determined by understanding the different types of intermolecular forces that will influence how much a sample can absorb. So as we should all know, it is always easier to heat a smaller sample than a larger one. And coincidentally, larger samples hold more heat than smaller samples. So this means that metallic bonding, so all metals, will hold the highest amount of heat, while things that are ionic bonding hold a medium amount of heat. Therefore, things that are covalent can hold the lowest amount of heat. This is why, for example, we use metal to cook with, but plastic, if we were to use to cook with, would immediately burn or vaporize into a gas. So if you flip to the table I in your reference tables, you will see the heat of reactions chart. The, this chart is going to be showing you the different values of how many kilojoules of energy are either lost if you have a negative delta H or gained if you have a positive delta H. So an example of this is when you go out to the beach. For example, the sand will be really hot, but when you jump into the ocean, it's relatively cool. And when you go back to your towel that's been out in the sun the entire time, it may be warm, but the plastic cooler is cool to the touch. This is because the heat capacity of all these different objects is dependent on its chemical bonding. So a calorimetry is the actual measurement that chemists will use to figure out the heat of a reaction for a chemical or physical process. So a calorimetry is going to be using a container that contains a sample that's sealed in a chamber of oxygen. That chamber is then immersed in a fluid like water where it is then analyzed via a thermometer for the changes in heat. So a law of conservation of heat states that the amount of heat that any sample releases has to be equivalent to the amount of heat absorbed by another system. So again, the specific heat capacity is the amount of heat needed to increase the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So if you're thinking, what does this mean? In reality, it just means that certain samples require more heat to make, them make their temperature rise by one degree Celsius. So the general formula, which is found on table T, is Q is equal to MC delta T. That formula, is when you're going to be trying to find Q, which is your heat. If you use the bottom formula where C is equal to Q over M delta T, that formula you'll be using if you need to find the specific heat capacity of something. So the variables are C is equal to your specific heat capacity, while Q is equal to heat, which can either be in joules or calories. M will always be the mass of your sample, and delta T represents the final temperature minus your starting temperature. The units for specific heat capacity can either be in joules per grams per Kelvin or calories per grams per Kelvin. So first off, delta T is calculated very simply. It's the final temperature being subtracted from the starting temperature. So let's try this problem. A calorimeter contains a solution that is at 93 degrees Celsius and cools to 34. So we know right there that our starting temperature is 93 while our final temperature is 34. So Mathematically, we have to say what is 34 minus 93? And you're probably wondering why is this going to be a negative number? This negative number tells us that we have lost that many degrees Celsius, which is going to be a symbol of an exothermic reaction. So here's another question. What is the change in temperature if you were outside in negative 5 degrees weather, but went inside to 32 degree weather? So again, you take your final temperature, which is 32 degrees Celsius, and you subtract it from five, negative five degrees Celsius. So you take your final temperature of 32 degrees Celsius and you subtract it from your negative five degree final temperature and you will determine that you have increased by 37 degrees Celsius. A gaining of heat means you have an endothermic reaction. So when we come to table B on our reference table, table B is gonna be very important for all thermochemical reactions. On the very bottom of table B, you're going to notice what our specific heat capacity of water is. Water is going to be the most commonly used substance that they ask you on the regions. For this situation, you need to know that 
the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per grams degree Kelvin. This means that water requires 4.18 joules for every gram of water that you want to heat. So the smaller the specific heat value, the faster the substance can heat up or cool down. So when you look at the elements, elements like nitrogen have a big number. That big number means it takes more energy for it to heat up. Unlike mercury, which is a liquid metal, requires very little energy to heat up. So therefore mercury would heat up in the fastest rate, but also cool down the fastest. And if you look in the compounds, you'll also notice that of all the different samples, water has the highest specific heat capacity. So let's practice some of these problems. We're going to be using the Q is equal to MC delta T formula. So we're going to calculate how much heat in joules 32 grams of water absorb when it is heated from 25 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we need to do is identify what the different variables are in our formula. So we're looking for the amount of heat, which is called Q. We know our mass, which is 32 grams. We know the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules because that comes right from table B. And we know our delta T, our change in temperature, is final minus start, and that tells us it's 55 degrees Celsius. So when we plug all of our variables into the formula, we'll notice that we're solving for Q again. And when we multiply everything together, we get a positive value. So this means that we had to absorb 7,356.8 joules. A lump of silver has a heat capacity of 42.8 joules and a mass of 181 grams. The change in temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So let's determine what the specific heat of silver is. Again, identify all the different variables that you have. You know that Q is equal to 42.8 joules. You know your mass is 181.0 grams. You're solving for your specific heat of silver. And you know the change in temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So now plug in all the variables. Simplify the right-hand side. Then you're going to be doing some division. So you're going to notice your specific heat capacity for silver is a very low value of 0 0.00946 joules per grams Kelvin. In our last question, you're given 132.8 joules of energy. And we're going to be using that to heat 11.17 grams of aluminum. Aluminum has a specific heat capacity of 0 0.89 joules per gram Kelvin. If the sample reached 75 degrees Celsius, that means it's the final temperature. What was its original temperature? So we're going to plug in the values that we know. We know that our amount of heat given is 132.8 joules. We know the mass of the sample is 11.17 grams. We know the specific heat capacity for aluminum is 0 0.89 joules per gram Kelvin. Now we have a final temperature but we don't know what the delta T is. The final temperature and delta T are not the same thing. So therefore we're plugging into the formula all the values that are given to us with the exception of delta T. As we simplify the right hand side of the equation, we get 132.8 is equal to 9.9x. .9 we divide both sides by 9.9 .9, and this tells us that our change in temperature is 13.4 degrees Celsius. This is the change in temperature. We know from previously the change in temperature is equal to your final temperature minus your starting temperature. Our final temperature is 75 degrees Celsius. Therefore, if we take 75 degrees Celsius and we subtract it from an, a value, which we're going to call our starting temperature, the change should be 13.4 degrees Celsius. So if you do the math to get x by itself, you will figure out that it's 61.6 .6 degrees Celsius. That was our original starting temperature that the aluminum was at before it was heated.